Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on your time zone. Uh, my name is Tim Besley. I'm a member of the economics department here at the LSE, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this public event on civil liberties in a time of crisis. Uh, this is the launch event for the Hayek uh, program in economics and liberal political economy here at the LSE. Uh, for those of you not aware, uh, Friedrich Hayek uh, was a member of the LSE economics department and also a Nobel laureate. And the purpose of the program is to discuss and debate issues that are relevant to uh, Hayek's uh, thinking, particularly around uh, the importance of uh, the market system, the role of the state, uh, knowledge and innovation. And uh, there can be no better person than to start off the program than Stephanie Stancheva from Harvard, who's joining us today. Stephanie is um, a, a professor of economics at Harvard um, and her main interests are in the impact of taxation on firms and individuals with a particular interest in the relationship between taxation and innovation. Uh, she also has an ongoing project, which is going to, I think, inform her work today, which studies the determinants of social preferences, attitudes, and perceptions. And uh, one of the striking things about Stephanie's work is uh, the breadth of thinking and ideas, uh, uh, as well as studying innovation, she is also an innovator in economic terms. And I'm delighted to welcome you today, Stephanie, to talk to us. Um, I should say to those uh, who, are, who are joining us, um, you can both pay, uh, uh, pose questions in the chat uh, on Zoom, and you can vote for the questions that have been posed by others, and we will be taking questions uh, uh, determined by which are those which are most popular with our audience. So without any uh, further ado, I'm going to hand over to Stephanie, uh, who's going to begin her presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you very much to LSE for the invitation. I'm delighted to be giving um, this Hayek lecture. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And here is the first, uh, first slide. So today I want to tell you about civil liberties in times of crisis. And this is a joint project uh, with Marcella Alsan, Luca Bragheri, Sarah Eichmeier, Joyce Kim, and David Young. So in this project, uh, we would like to study how people think about civil liberties in times of major crisis. Um, what are civil liberties? It's the right to self-determination, the right to privacy, to free movement, free speech, worship, and procedural fairness, very much as defined by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And the guarantee of such civil liberties is obviously a key function of liberal democracies, according to uh, the major thinkers here on this slide, and it's often considered to be a non-tradable sacred value or values. But when a crisis happens, uh, for instance, like the one we're currently living through, curtailing civil liberties may be one of the policy responses, at least in the short run. And so from terrorist attacks to natural disasters to pandemics, like the one we're living through, um, civil liberties are sometimes restricted in order to take more efficient public action. And so if we go back to 1918 in the big influenza pandemic, uh, there was already a lot of debate uh, in the media about how much restrictions, how many restrictions people were willing to endure. Uh, so the news titles go between, you know, everything should be closed, but also everybody should go vote and express, uh, express their opinions. And then the debates that we see today about wearing masks um, as a restriction to liberty, having to stay home, having to social distance, they're not necessarily new um, in, the, in the general sense. This, this journal article here from 1918 shows you that there was already an anti-mask movement back then, so very much in line with what's happening today. And you know, things continue to a more deep level uh, lots and lots of um, ink has been has been spilled over what's happening to civil liberties um, during this this current pandemic. And so, in this paper, what we would like to do is to study in real time how citizens trade off civil liberties and health during one of the largest crises in recent history. 
So how do they view the fundamental trade-off between well-being uh, and liberty? What are they willing to sacrifice versus what are they steadfast in supporting no matter what? And then what factors shape these trade-offs? So particularly, does your personal health risk, does that play a major role? And how do these trade-offs vary across countries and across demographics? For instance, do low-income people respond differently from high-income people, et cetera? Another important thing is, how do these perceived trade-offs vary over time as the crisis unfolds? It is not just a snapshot that we're going to show you, but actually an evolution over the past months. What we're going to use is large-scale surveys that span 12 countries and many months, basically since March and still ongoing, that include both natural or quasi-experimental variation and also experimental variation that we design. And the goal will be to provide insights into these fundamental questions here. As a side note, I would like to already um, ask the question why this may be important for policy, and I'll come back to this in the conclusion. But in democratic uh, societies, typically the policy response should be responsive to some extent to preferences. So it's important to understand the trade-offs and limits that people have in mind. And in addition, the compliance that people have with various measures might reflect their agreement with a given policy. Another important thing is that if the willingness to give up rights is actually temporary, and we will see that there's quite some interesting dynamics involved, then maybe safeguards are needed as a crisis comes to an end. So what may have to be prevented is a more long-term you know, slip into restrictions when in fact what people want is just a temporary one. Okay, so to preview the big findings before I go into our actual analysis, what we will find is that citizens do trade off civil liberties for public health concerns during this particular crisis. Um, it's not fully inelastic. It is not the case that these civil liberties are viewed as sacred values. People are willing to give up, to some extent, those liberties. The willingness to give up liberties varies greatly across countries and across individuals. So those who are more disadvantaged, think of the lower income, uh, the unemployed, are less willing to trade off liberties. And they're also going to be less elastic with respect to their own health risks. Another thing we will find is that providing information on two different aspects, if you want two completely polar opposite aspects, namely one on the possible erosion of civil liberties and the other on the public health benefits of these interventions will actually really change people's views. So there will be an effect of actually providing people with information. And then finally, the relationship between personal health risk and civil liberties is actually quite constant over time. So that fundamental trade-off seems to be, you know, not moving over time, but the concerns are shifting. So over time, at least until now, what we will see is that people's willingness to sacrifice rights is actually declining and then plateauing at the same time as health worries will be also declining and plateauing. What I would hope to cover in this uh, short talk is first to introduce the surveys and the data that we design and then uh, collect. And then a, a basic set of stylized facts on how people trade off civil liberties. Then I wanna show you the quasi-experimental relationship between individual health risk and civil liberties in the various countries. Turn to the experimental variation that shows the effects of information. And then look at the dynamic longer run effects and how these trade-offs evolve over time. So let's start with the surveys and the data. We start with a big, large-scale cross-country uh, survey that we're going to call the COVID-19 and Civil Liberties Survey. I'm going to, for short, say this is our main survey, our main instrument. It will cover a representative sample of around 16,000 individuals from seven countries. So those countries are the United States, the United Kingdom, Italy, France, Germany, South Korea, and China. The data collection for this particular survey happened between March and April 18th. It's broadly representative. Um, I can click on the, on the, on the button. Uh, you can also see the table in your paper. But what we did do is to oversample at that time what was COVID-19 hotspots. So within the country, 80% of the sample will be geographically representative. The other 20% will be oversampled from the hotspots. <clears throat> 
we tried to select countries that at that time were at slightly different stages of the pandemic um, to possibly allow for this to have influenced people differently. Another important tool that we will use is the second survey, which is the COVID-19 Global Consumer Trend Reports. This is actually based on a commercial survey that's run uh, by a commercial company in many countries um, and that allowed us to add a subset of our core questions to their weekly survey. So this is still ongoing. Uh, there's, around ten, ten, there's around a thousand representative respondents per country per week. So currently our sample is around 225,000 and it's still ongoing. So hopefully that sample will increase. The major countries we cover here are broader than our baseline sample. So there's Australia, Canada, India, Japan, the Netherlands, Singapore, and Spain, in addition to our other core countries. So in a snapshot, our core survey instrument will look something like that. So we will start with a demographics block that will ask people about their gender, their age, where they live, their occupation, et cetera. We will then move to a quite important health module that will ask people about what we would call pre-existing conditions, uh, in particular also conditions that require frequent hospital use and some that may affect your likelihood of suffering from COVID-19. We also ask them a range of self-assessed uh, expectations about the likelihood of contracting COVID-19 um, in their community, what the risk is, how many people they expect to die, etc. After that comes the experimental part where people are split into a control group that will not see any information and then a group that will see the civil liberties treatment and one that will see the public health treatment. I will only talk about that in the, in the final part of the presentation. So for now, we're going to focus on a more descriptive set of results, which are uh, the outcomes at the very bottom that ask about policy views, about governance, about forecasts, also about COVID-19 knowledge, and so this is the part I'm going to focus on now. So a major part in these outcome questions is a set of new questions that we designed in order to elicit the key trade-offs people have in mind. What we did is to strike a balance between using some existing questions, for instance, those asked in the World Value Survey, so that we have a benchmark in time and that we can actually check that those questions, you know, either look similar outside of hotspots, for instance, and very different in hotspots, and then we also add some new questions, which we think neatly get at a quantitative trade-off that is particularly relevant to us. So let me spend a bit of time on telling you those key trade-off questions that we ask. So a core trade-off question that's asked in both the very large survey that's still ongoing in many countries and in our core survey is this. So on a scale of zero to 10, to what extent do you agree with the following statements? And basically, this, the questions will be variations on, I am willing to you know, sacrifice this and this during a crisis for the health and well-being of society. There is some variation in the formulations, so you can see the exact wording in the paper. We can also address it during the Q&A, but this is the broad spirit of those questions. And what are the sacrifices that we ask people about? Well, whether they're willing to sacrifice their own rights and freedoms, whether they're willing to impose limits on the rights and freedoms of others, whether they're willing to relax privacy restrictions, suspend democratic procedures, tolerate public risks to fulfill civic duties or not, let the government control the media and endure substantial economic losses. After these core questions, uh, we have this innovative question that's very quantitative that we were really excited to ask which is basically asking people, out of 100 people who would otherwise have died in your country because of COVID-19, some could be saved if one of the following policies is implemented. And then we give people a range of policies and we ask, what is the minimum number of lives that each of these policies would have to save in order for you to support it? And so people have to move a slider here, ranging from extremely desirable policy, so even if very few lives are saved, I'm happy to support it, versus extremely undesirable policies, even you know, if a lot of lives are saved, I still don't wanna support it. And we try to make this very clear to people by both having the slider, explaining what's desirable, not desirable, and then also the text appearing below in an interactive way um, that lets people see what they're actually inputting into the slider. 
So for me to support this policy, it would have to save at least X lives and the X is changing as you move. So what are the policies that we ask about? Well, they're related to privacy, whether the government should be able to track smartphone locations, social contacts, et cetera, of those who tested positive versus of all citizens, whether the government should be able to close national borders, recommend people don't leave their homes, arrest citizens who leave their homes. There are things about the closures, for instance, closing restaurants, bars, entertainments versus all non-essential businesses versus schools. There's some questions on economic well-being. So in a very you know, holistic fashion, what are people willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to tolerate policies that double the unemployment rate, triple it, cut the pay of low-income workers, et cetera? One important thing is that, of course, there's no perfect way to ask any question. This has the advantage of really you know, benchmarking to out of 100 people who would have died without having to take a stand on how effective we think those policies are just letting people express the support. But we also elicit from people the perceived severity of the crisis. So we asked them, how many people do you expect will die by the end of COVID-19 or in six months in your community and overall? And so we actually have a benchmark to see. And in one of our robustness checks, we'll be able to control for that to see whether mechanically the answers are related to how severe you think the crisis is. And the results are, are quite robust. In addition, having these different policies asked um, within person allows us to also compare within person how the answers vary. Another question that we ask is actually what you could call a more real or hard effect, which is to ask people if they're interested in exploring and possibly downloading a tracker app. So in March, one of the major apps was developed by MIT and is basically able to track those who you've been in contact with and to help tracing. And so we ask people whether they're willing to install or look for more information on this app. Okay. I'm going to skip the summary statistics, which basically are there to convince you that the sample is quite representative in each country. Um, so for those of you interested, those tables are in the paper and then they also compare to other nationally representative surveys in each country. Uh, for now, you can take my word for it that uh, both big surveys are quite representative of the population. Okay, let's look at some key stylized facts on how people trade off civil liberties. So the first thing is to see that many people are willing to some extent to give up some of their own rights uh, in exchange for better public intervention and for more protection of health and well-being. So on this chart, you can see the share of people who agree that they're willing to give up their own rights to protect health and well being of the entire society per country. Uh, the vertical dashed line is actually the US. And so the US is close to the bottom, it's the almost last country here. And so everything is benchmarked relative to the US. So the part in red is what goes beyond and above. Those are countries that support uh, giving up those liberties more than people in the US. So what you can actually see is that EU countries, for instance, are consistently more willing to give up their own rights than people in the US. The US is very close to the bottom, together with Japan. China is the country that is most willing to sacrifice own rights for public health and safety. But across the board, there's actually a very, you know, a very low share of people who are completely unwilling to, to make this sacrifice. We can look at the other outcome questions. So similar graphs, but for other outcomes. Uh, so the left panel is again, sacrifice own rights that we just saw. The next one is to relax privacy protections. The third is to suspend democratic procedure. The bottom left is to sacrifice the free press and the bottom right is to endure economic losses. So in general, people are much more willing to forgo their own rights and to endure economic losses than they are to relax privacy protection or even worse, sacrifice the free press or democratic procedures. So if you think of those as going from least strict to most strict, these patterns make a lot of sense. And again, across the board, European countries seem to be much more willing um, than the US to give up those rights. And China is typically at the top of the ranking in terms of willingness to give up. You will also notice there's some questions we could not ask in China. Uh, so the, the top right, for instance, is lacking China. We cannot show the willingness to suspend democratic procedures question there. But broadly speaking, the questions are the same in all countries. Moving on, you may wonder, just as a basic correlation, 
what sort of concerns um, are actually most correlated with people's willingness to give up rights? So this is based on the very large sample and it's correlating this willingness to give up various rights as listed on the left vertically that we just saw with an indicator for health concerns in red. The next one is an indicator for economic worries. And then the third is a worry about the long run erosion of civil liberties. Uh, so these questions are pooled for all the countries. We include always country fixed effects and also weak fixed effects for time passing. So it's a very large sample. And overall, what you can see is that health concerns are most positively correlated with the willingness to give up all those rights. For now, this is just a correlation. We'll dig into the quasi-experimental and experimental pattern in a minute. But uh, already as a correlation, we can see that those who are most worried about health are also most willing to sacrifice those rights. Those who are more worried about civil liberties eroding um, are of course least willing to sacrifice those rights. The effect is actually in magnitudes smaller. These are standardized indices than for health. And economics is actually you know, pretty insignificant here. Um, so economic worries are much less, you know, much less correlated with all those willingness to give up rights. Now let's jump into something more causal. Uh, so let's go into the quasi-experimental variation in health risk. So what we're going to do is to ask, are people who are more affected by this health crisis, who are more at risk, who are more exposed, are they most willing to give up their own rights or the rights of others in society? And we're basically trying to mimic if a crisis hits, of course here it's hitting the whole world, it's a pandemic, but if it's hitting you stronger, if it's hitting people stronger, can we try to mimic that with some quasi-experimental variation? And for that, we can leverage um, two aspects. One is the geographic exposure, which is basically where you are. And so whether you're in a hotspot, for instance, and we can have different measures of that, either it will be one of those cities listed here that were labeled hotspots in March and April, or we can actually use you know, distance to uh, hotspots. We can use the number of local cases, uh, irrespective of whether it's a hotspot or not. So we do a lot, of, a lot of robustness work on this. And then the second big thing we want to leverage is your own health risk. For that, we're going to use uh, you know, medical community developed health risk. Uh, it's called the Mathematica's risk tool 19 and me, which will basically be based on age, gender, and then pre-existing conditions such as chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, and pregnancy as health risk factors. We're going to actually interact that with the behaviors we elicit as well. Um, namely, you know, do you, do you engage in hand washing and social distancing? And we're always going to look at the leave one out mean for those uh, at some group level so that we avoid endogeneity in your own behavior. So putting all this together, we can actually get a pretty good sense of people's exposure, whether driven by geography, by their own health, or by the behaviors of those around them. And so in more detail, formally, the health risk index of person I uh, is going to depend on your probability of being infected by COVID-19 and then the severity of it, basically the probability of dying from it, um, conditional on infection. We could have this more general, by the way, instead of the probability of death, you could view this as the probability of getting a severe uh, case of COVID-19. The K is because we have two different versions of the index, which I'm going to tell you about in a second. So the probability of getting the COVID-19 infection uh, is basically based on this Mathematica 19andMe model, which is developed by, by the medical community. So it's going to be a transform of what's called the exposure odds ratio. And so the exposure odds ratio is basically a function of your actual exposure and then risk mitigating behaviors. So the exposure is going to be this function here which is basically one minus the probability that you don't get it at all. And the probability that you get it is the probability of transmission with a transmission function, big T, scaled to the number of contacts that you have. And so in the transmission function, big T, there is a transmission rate tau that's actually, again, fixed by the medical community. Think of it as the replication rate in a sense of the virus. 
And then rho is the proxy for prevalence. And this is where we will have two versions of prevalence. Let me, before I go to the explanation of the, um, of the medication behaviors, et cetera, also mention that the second term here, the probability of COVID-19 death, that's constructed based on the empirical odds of dying from COVID-19 given certain medical conditions and sociodemographic factors. So we actually update the original risk score here to take into account the more recent data. Uh, and so it relies from analysis of actually the UK's NHS system uh, on a very big sample that was, that was recently done. And so it really includes, you know, higher odds for age, for lower income, for being male, for obesity, smoking, chronic uh, pulmonary disease, et cetera, et cetera. On the index here, uh, on the exposure, what we're going to use for risk mitigating behaviors are at the time, uh, hand hygiene, whether you wash your hands and whether you social distance. And the risk mitigating behaviors, you see they're sub-indexed by minus I, which means we're going to use the leave one out mean of those measures for people who are in the same area as you. Uh, an area is going to be defined at you know, relatively small geographic levels for each country. And you could do this differently. You could also just uh, scale people by the distance they actually have to the respondent. So let this decay exponentially. Uh, and so there's various ways to construct both the number of contacts and the risk mitigating behaviors. But I hope I'm conveying the spirit that for exposure, we're basically using things that depend on medical estimates about transmission and prevalence and risk mitigating behaviors that depend on everyone else around you, not necessarily your own behaviors. Now, moving to the different versions of these indices that we, that we construct. So the first index will directly incorporate the local prevalence of COVID-19 uh, into the transmission rate. So specifically, it's the leave one out mean of the respondents that have an acquaintance infected with COVID-19 in, in the geographic area. Okay. And the second index will be uh, slightly different. So on this first index, um, it relies really on the nonlinearity for identification. Uh, so conditional on controlling for all the factors that enter the risk linearly, we're exploiting the nonlinearity in the index uh, to, a, to identify an exogenous effect of that health risk. And so the, you know, the identification is that we have correctly specified that function. Again, it's not specified by us, but by the medical community but this is the identification that needs to hold for this to be uh, valid. We do a range of robustnesses, um, already mentioned a few, and how we construct the severity and how we construct the exposure. And we also do some sort of placebo tests by replacing the actual conditions that are relevant by placebo conditions, you know, like back pain and things like that, and they don't actually work. We can also do placebo tests on the location, um, and that also does not work. So those are reassuring. Index two is different. Index two is actually going to uh, set the row, the prevalence to one, but it's going to interact with whether you are in a hotspot. So this is purely perhaps more easily interpretable, your own risk interacted with whether you are in a hotspot. And here again, uh, the identification relies on comparing those who are at higher risk within and outside of hotspot location. And basically what you need is this sort of parallel trend assumption, namely that absent COVID-19, those at higher risk inside a hotspot would have had the same elasticity with respect to trading off rights as those outside. And here again, there's a lot of robustness checks you can do on how you construct the hotspot. Um, and we do all of these, I won't have time to cover them, but one thing you can do to check the pre-trend is to see whether people have changed their views in the last two weeks, because we have that question. We ask them on all the various outcomes, whether they have changed their views. And we can see that those who are more exposed have not differentially changed their views from others. So that's, if you want, our little mild test for a pre-trend, but it's nice to have that. Okay, now what are the actual results? Um, so in this table, you can see specification one, that's in columns three and four, and then specification two, the outcomes are in rows, and the health risk indicator coefficients are in the columns. So the second column gives you the scale of the question that I already explained. So for instance, agree from zero to 10 on the Likert scale. 
In this panel here, we're focusing on the overall rights and freedoms. So the first line is willing to give up your own rights. The second is willing to give up others' rights. And then the third row aggregates this into one Z-score for willingness to give up rights. So both specifications give pretty coherent risks, which are that your willingness to give up rights is increasing as your health risk increases. In particular, in the first specification, if we look at the Z-score, your willingness to give up rights increases by 0.07 standard deviations as your health risk increases. And you may wonder whether that's actually large. Well, to benchmark it, we could look at column seven, which is giving us the gap in responses on average between the US and China. Remember the US and China are quite far out on the polar extremes of willingness to give up rights. So if we use that gap as a benchmark, the effects are basically 14% of the US-China gap. So pretty sizable. We can go through the other outcomes and they will show similar patterns. So if we look at the willingness to give up privacy as another group of outcomes, again, different variables listed in rows and then the Z-score aggregating them at the bottom, we see that your willingness to give up privacy increases uh, in the first specification by 0.02 standard deviations. On total, it's not statistically significant. Um, individual components like willingness to give up privacy are very significant. And specification two, everything is also significant, including the individual components. And then this is around 8% of the US-China gap effect. We can also look at the willingness to give up democratic rights and duties. In this case, the willingness to curtail rights increases between 0.02 or 0.03 standard deviations, depending on the specification. It's more solid in specification one, but the willingness to suspend democratic procedures is very consistent and very significant in both, uh, in both specifications. Now, you may wonder whether this is consistently the case across different groups. And some heterogeneity results, which you can see in a table quantitatively in the paper, but which I'm telling you here qualitatively are, if we look at subgroups based on income, education, labor market status, or economic vulnerability, or by political leanings or attitudes, or by age, gender, race, there are several patterns that emerge, but the key ones are that your increase in willingness to trade off liberties due to COVID-19 risk exposure are particularly stronger among the young, the educated, non-Black Hispanic in the US, those who are employed and those who are economically secure. And so one question that we may discuss during the Q&A and that I would love to think more about is whether the ability to trade off rights and freedoms is actually a luxury good. Something that only those who do not need that protection, who don't necessarily you know, depend on having to go to work, not doing those restrictions, for their livelihood, whether only those people are able to really consider trading those liberties off. Now, switching to the experimental variation, now we're going to ask, okay, if you made either the civil liberties or the public health aspect more salient to people and provided them information about it, are they going to change their views? So in the experimental part, which to remind you comes at this point in the survey, so people are gonna go, either into the health treatment or into the civil liberty treatment, and we're going to compare them to the control group. What we're trying to do is to really uh, make one of the two aspects salient with each treatment. So in the health treatment, we're going to describe uh, the potential for public health interventions to save lives. And so we're gonna describe what exponential spread is in layman's terms with the aid of graphics, communicate the supply side constraints, namely, for instance, hospitals that are overcrowded. We're gonna discuss that the epidemic curve is endogenous basically, and that the ability all citizens have to flatten it by public health measures such as social distancing, how that could work. We don't provide any info about COVID-19 symptoms or the specifics of transmission. So in the just three, four minutes I have left, I'll walk you through those experimental, uh, experimental results. So here are a bunch of screenshots that you can see animated um, either online or this whole series of screenshots in the paper that you know graphically try to explain how this spreads and what can be done to interrupt it. Showing for instance also the curve and how this could be flattened with measures. 
And then the civil liberties treatment shows a totally different aspect. It focuses on the possible risks of erosion of rights. And what it's going to do is to actually present examples from China and South Korea, which took quite drastic actions, managed to curtail the virus early on very, very well, uh, but described that the policies that were enacted were, you know, for instance, aggressive stay at home orders, door to door temperature screenings, forcible quarantines, personal GPS tracking, even revelation of personal info, et cetera, et cetera. And it highlights how short term restrictions could sometimes extend much longer. So some screenshots here, which are a bit ominous, uh, showing really the possible dangers of civil liberties curtailing uh, that, again, you can see online in more detail. And so what do we find? I won't have time to walk through all the tables, but the results are going to basically be, as you may expect, that the public health treatment is going to move people a little bit on some dimensions that are related to taking action. But what's going to especially happen is that the civil liberties treatment will make people much less willing to engage in all those liberty restrictions. And the effects are gonna be quite large. So for instance, it's going to reduce your overall willingness to give up rights uh, to an amount equal to one ninth or one tenth of the difference between US and China. We will see similar effects on trading off protection of privacy. Uh, the difference will be, again, significant for the civil liberties treatment relative to the US-China gap. And similarly for other outcomes, which I'm just gonna dash through now, such as, for instance, uh, giving up democratic rights and duties, and then um, other things that you can see in the paper. But what I wanna end on is the dynamics, which is a particular value added of having this very long-term data on many countries and hundreds of thousands at this point respondents over time. So are these preferences stable or not? Well, the first thing we can see is that in general, over time, if you look at these graphs, which each represent a given willingness to give up rights as a function of the weeks that have passed since March 30th. So each tick here is a week. And then you can see over time what's happening to the willingness to sacrifice rights relative to what it was benchmarked at zero in end of March. So across the board, the willingness to sacrifice rights, to relax privacy, suspend democratic procedures, et cetera, et cetera, is declining initially and then plateauing. And you may say, okay, so this was just a temporary effect. This is really just a snapshot, but not quite, because if you look at the worries that people have, and these are indices, again, aggregating all the health worries about yourself, your family, the elderly, your community, the econ worries in the middle, and then the civil liberty worries, what you can see is that civil liberty worries remain relatively constant. Econ worries decline and health worries decline and plateau and actually bump slightly up as things have gotten worse again. And so if you just take, if you want the ratio or just regress the willingness to trade off rights on those worries over time, that relationship is very stable. So the fundamental trade-off, which is plotted here, basically the regression coefficients on willingness to sacrifice, on, on health worries, um, about sacrificing rights, relaxing privacy, et cetera, over time is remarkably stable. So the fact that people's willingness to give up rights declines is mirrored by their declining worries. And by the way, for good or reason or not, because we know what's happening with cases going back up. But the key is, as the worries decline, the willingness to give up rights declines as well. And so just to conclude, obviously the decisions we're currently taking may shape things in the long run, so what we show here is that the descriptive, the quasi-experimental and the experimental evidence all point to the fact that exposure to the pandemic can shift citizens' preferences, at least in the short run, and particularly health risks make you more likely to want to give up civil liberties, rights, and freedoms. These results are entirely positive. And so we may discuss during the Q&A what are the normative implications. Well, we see two possible ones, but this is just to open it up. One is that possibly improved understanding, the way we provide it, for instance, in the public health treatment, can increase support and compliance. So giving people understanding may generate compliance. And the other important result is in the dynamic evolution. You see that the willingness to give up rights is temporary. It mirrors the worries that evolve over time. And so that really points to the need for safeguards. You know, fast action may be needed. People may agree with that but there need to be safeguards that rights can then return 
to good levels. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Stephanie. That's great. Um, can I just kick off with a, a kind of broad question about the interpretation? Um, so there are these strong differences across countries. Um, how, how do, where do you think they're rooted? I know I'm, I'm not inviting you to speculate here, but are they rooted in things like culture? I mean, is that the right way to think about this? I mean, what's very striking, I thought, was that the, the dynamics suggest that you know, people's views shift quite quickly in some respects. But yet, presumably, the big difference between having been brought up in an environment with democratic freedoms around you versus not is pretty hard to shift. You're going to have had a lot of exposure to that. So but just perhaps backing up, what, what, what's your sort of main interpretation about the differences across countries and what, what, what the origins of those are? This is obviously a very, very interesting question. And at the country level, we can't really identify right, anything, but to speculate, as you, as you, as you point out. So one thing that we see um, is that uh, those who were brought up uh, in Eastern Germany, so you know, during a much more severe, um, severe restrictions regime, or those who have contact with North Korea uh, because a relative, et cetera, we can see that those people are much more averse to giving up rights. So that's, um, if you want, one indicator that your history and what you've already experienced for sure influences your, your views. So those results are in the paper in the heterogeneity analysis. Mm -hmm. Just looking broadly at the, at the countries, it's clear that um, there's a lot of heterogeneity also within country between people who are exposed or not, people who are young versus uh, older, people on the left, on the right. So all those results are also quite, quite important within country. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's some, there's some cultural differences. What we can do is to, without again, being able to make any causal statement, we can correlate this with indices that are out there like individualism indices. Um, and it's, it is quite correlated with those uh, in, in the directions that, that you may expect that, you know, more individualistic countries are actually much more willing to preserve own rights as opposed to giving up for the common good. Uh, and the opposite is true in less individualistic countries. So I think much more work could be done with the data we've collected to just correlate it with existing measures as well. Um, nothing will be causal, but it will be very interesting to dig further into that. And I think the historical results about where you grew up, for instance, like in Eastern Germany versus West Germany are also very interesting in that respect. Thanks. So I, I, I think related to that, I have my, the first question I want to ask was posed by Alison Rankin Frost, who says, do your results support the notion that civil liberties are less valued by those who've never had them, i.e. China, e.g. China, and those who've never had them challenged or threatened? And that you could think the young and the well-educated would be in that category. Mm, I, I think that's a very interesting hypothesis. And um, obviously, the one thing we can't quite identify is exactly those cross-country differences, as I just, as I just told Tim. But indeed, what we see, and I just mentioned this verbally, uh, and that's why I raised the question, is it a luxury good in a sense? Or is it, as you may say, people have just never experienced a challenge to those liberties truly, so they may not understand the full implications. What we do see is that those who are, yes, younger, more secure, already in a, you know, have a job, they haven't been made unemployed, um, they are much more willing to give up or to say they're going to give up those rights. And they're also less elastic to health risk. Um, and so, yes, it could be, this is a luxury good. You know, people who are less secure just feel like it's a threat. It's a very big threat to forego those liberties, including because it may prevent them from actually, you know, going to work and maintaining their livelihoods. Or it could be, as, as you suggest, that people who are just well off and secure may have just never experienced the true bite of such restrictions. Um, so it would be interesting to keep seeing how this evolves over time, uh, whether such a fatigue kicks in, for instance, as people actually start experiencing more and more restrictions and they understand what those mean, whether that will change views. Okay, I have one uh, specific question uh, that came from Heidi Zamzau, who's an LSE PhD student. Why didn't you include wearing a face mask in your risk factors? So that's an excellent question. And we, so the big, the big uh, survey uh, was done in March. And so in the mitigating behaviors, uh, 
uh, when we have a social distancing and hand washing, which were the recommended things at that time. So mask wearing started being recommended later. And so there was, you know, very, very, very little mask wearing uh, in, in, I mean, in the Western countries for sure at that time. So we're thinking of redoing another big wave of surveys right now, actually, uh, in the, with these in-depth questions. And at that point, we will for sure include mask wearing which by the way, has become a very polarized issue, at least in the US. So if you forgive me for another quite broad question, um, I mean, this is very innovative analysis. How, how do you see this feeding into the kinds of policy debates that we're having in different countries? Do you, have you engaged with policymakers on the findings and do you, does, do you think it can shape uh, policy priorities? Or is it really much more of a sort of intellectual and academic exercise and less one that's going to actually drive policy? I mean, we, we want to be humble here. Um, you know, we, we are willing to, and eager to know what's going on in people's minds. And so we are, our ambition is very much, you know, in a positive way, like positive as opposed to normative, describe what is actually going on. And our goal was really to go, uh, you know, in many countries, keep going over time to see how this is changing and then try to be exhaustive in terms of looking at it descriptively with quasi-experimental variation and then also experimentally. And so hopefully we can draw here a bit of an anatomy of what's going on during this crisis in people's minds on these various dimensions. On the normative part, um, really, I think, I mean, for interested policymakers, I think the two things I concluded on uh, could be the, the relevant lessons. One is that People will respond to information if it's if you want well explained. For instance, the public health interventions explaining what does it mean for exp to have exponential uh, spread? What does it mean to flatten the curve? Obviously, these are things which by now hopefully we've all internalized. They were quite new in March. Today, it may be more about the benefits of mask wearing. In a in a few weeks, it may be about the benefits or costs of a vaccine. And so, these information messages could be if provided well, quite effective in increasing compliance and support for various measures. And the other important thing is that people are worried about civil liberties. They're willing to trade them off, but that willingness is not forever. And so a responsive policymaker would make sure to reassure people that this is not forever. This is a temporary measure and we have these safeguards in place so that we will revert back as soon as the risk and threat is over. I have another question that came from the, the chat, which, which goes, considering that many countries are experiencing a recession due to lockdowns, would people in those countries still be willing to give up civil liberties as the economy itself declines? That's from JP Villasor, who's a LSE alumnus. Um, I didn't catch the very first part of the question. Uh, so it's considering that many countries are experiencing a recession mm. due to the lockdowns, would that mean that people in these countries are, still be willing to give up civil liberties as the economy yes. declines? Well, what's what's wonderful is that uh, we don't need to speculate on that because the the survey collection is still ongoing on these on these many countries. That's the bigger global tracker. Um, and so what you can what you could already see in the final graphs I showed is that there is a bit of an uptick in the worries um, and everything mirrors the willingness again, the renewed willingness but it's not major as the worries don't increase to the same extent as they increased uh, initially. So we will see what happens over time. I'm not going to speculate more. For now, this link is very stable, but it really depends what happens to worries. Uh, if worries don't keep increasing, then according to the stable relationship, there won't be a renewed willingness. If worries again start rising, we could expect if it's stable. And another thing to note is that those who are more vulnerable, um, if you, if you look at our quasi-experimental results I mentioned verbally, those who are more vulnerable are less willing to give up rights, even if they're faced with health risk. And as this crisis unfolds, it's likely that more and more people become vulnerable um, as they lose their jobs, as, you know, as they become economically less secure. And so if those results are to be extrapolated, you may expect that less people will be willing to give up rights. So the composition may shift uh, as we shift towards more people being vulnerable to economic risk, et cetera, we may actually shift that balance. So I, I, one thing that I'm slightly curious about is that you, 
you have the results. You, you were always comparing China and the US. But Europe's sort of interesting too, because Europe was kind of broadly coming out somewhere in the, in the middle. Um, and uh, I, I was struck that, that Europe seems to, va to in general, be, be more willing to give up uh, liberties. Um, where do you think that's coming from? Is that the nature of the demographic uh, democratic tradition in Europe compared to the US? I, you know, is, is there something you can say on, on why Europe's different? Is it the nature of the welfare state? I don't know. There's so many things going on, I know, but, but any, any thoughts on, on what's yes. driving the European differences? No, it, it, it's, it's really interesting because, um, uh, you know, Europe has much stronger and stricter privacy protection currently with GDPR, for those of you, you know, who try to do research in Europe, uh, all the all the hurdles that have to be gone through in order to even survey people, for instance, are much, much higher. And so it's, it's interesting that there's this contrast between the, the policy um, with GDPR and privacy protection in Europe versus the willingness of people to give up, to give up rights. If we're going to look at it purely descriptively like that, at that time, um, you know, in the beginning, you know, Europe was very, very strongly affected and quite rapidly and quite drastically. So for instance, if you look at Italy, it was, you know, absolutely slammed in the beginning uh, by COVID-19. And so you could imagine that this is what's playing a role there. Um, again, what's very interesting is to see how this changes over time, particularly as for instance, the US has become much more severely affected relative to other European countries. But again, I think those cross country things could be correlated with many more factors by us maybe, but also by other people who are interested and who have other measures out there and could be tracked over time as well. So I have another question from the chat from Tim Frost, who's an LSE graduate. Um, do you plan to try and survey policymakers' views? Would you expect them to correlate well with citizens' views? Would they lead or follow? And have you had interest in your results from policymakers? Um, I would be very interested in surveying, you know, whoever, whoever wants to be surveyed. <laughs> um, joking aside, I think that would be that that could be very, very interesting to see. Uh, I'm sure that going back to the cross country comparisons, there would be very big differences across countries in how aligned citizens are with their governments. And also within country, there's big political, you know, cleavages. Um, so just to take the example of the US where I'm quite, you know, aware of the um, every day of the differences, uh, even something as simple as, you know, mask wearing has become a majorly polarized issue. Uh, and so I'm expecting similar, you know, polarizations on, on vaccines and on other measures. Um, so I think it would be very interesting to see, uh, to see the, the, the policy responses. Um, we have shared actually part of this with some policymakers, including um, in France. Um, so we will see if this will have any, any effect. Okay, uh, an, another result, uh, another, sorry, question from the, um, from the online questions was from, as I was saying, is it possible that disadvantaged people are primarily located in countries that do not respect civil liberties? So we can exp expect people in these countries to be willing to lose their freedom temporarily due to the trust issues with their government. So on the, on the result that those who are economically vulnerable are less, you know, less willing to sacrifice rights, um, all of these results are conditional on country, even on finer region fixed effects, on all the other characteristics. So when I mentioned those verbally, it was perhaps not so clear. There's, there's detailed tables in the draft, but this is conditional on everything else. So we're not here comparing across countries. Now, to go back to the cross-country comparisons, you may then ask, so is the composition of people in the countries, you know, least willing to give up rights, uh, more tilted towards the economically vulnerable? Actually, no, because, you know, the, the US, for instance, is one of the countries least willing to give up rights. Uh, if we compare it, it's by no means the one that has, you know, the most economically vulnerable populations from the whole sample. Um, so that's really playing a role for every individual. I'm not sure that can explain the cross-country patterns. And, and another question, um, again, from the chat. Um, is there any pattern in your current analysis with the kind of governing system? Again, it's a kind of cross-country 
comparisons question yet again. I guess that's uh, provoking a lot of uh, interest. Uh, can, can one say, I mean, obviously, again, China, the US, but more generally, do you think this is the governing system is critical and trusting government is critical to what you're finding? We actually have questions about trust of government in there. Um, and so you can you can definitely look at the at the heterogeneity by that. And uh, there is some heterogeneity, but it's not that stark, actually. So it it seems to be once, you know, you put in if you want a country fixed effect, that's that's gone. Um, mm-hmm. And so, again, across countries, it's not necessarily identified, given given all the other things that that vary by country. Um, in general, it's actually it's hard to also say that there's a systematic difference, say, between the Europe and the US. It starts to be a bit more also about which parties, you know, currently in power and how people align with that. So I think that question about trust in government explaining cross country comparisons is, is quite tricky to answer. But what I can tell you that within person, like condition on country, your trust in the government is not a first order predictor of this. And do, do I noticed that perhaps I was um, not paying attention sufficiently, but there were no uh, Nordic countries in any of your data sets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I guess if we if you'd known in advance that Sweden, for example, was going to take a rather different approach, okay. you might have been particularly interested in including Sweden. And, yeah. and on many things, we know the, the Nordics look different. But do you is is there anything you know you you're going to do in future on that, or have anything to say around that? Yeah, absolutely. So first in the, you know, in the global tracker, um, it wasn't, you know, it's not our sample in a sense, it's this, this major commercial company running it and they, um, they let us add our questions. Uh, and so there were no Scandinavian countries there. In our own, it was definitely a missed opportunity had we known what the special Swedish experience would have been. Um, but now we can I mean, obviously we can still do service and we are planning to do more rounds. So one, one thing, for instance, we were definitely going to add is India, which has also had a very specific experience and we would be interested in seeing that. And then a Scandinavian country, I mean, in this case, very likely it may be Sweden, um, would be very interesting to include again. So this is basically to do. Um, Great, well, thank you. Um, and so I, I think what's wonderful about this this project is now I'm, I'm, I'm imagining you're going to keep working on this for as long as, well, maybe even beyond COVID, but COVID's going to be around for a good deal longer. So, and, and I think it really illustrates uh, the value uh, of, of measurement when it comes to debating questions around uh, liberties and, and uh, uh, the way people think about their freedoms. And so uh, it's really been, been wonderful for us today that you were, you were able to share um, these results with us. Um, I'm tempted to say we're going to invite you back uh, at a suitable point in future to give us an update because the Hayek program uh, that, that this is the launch if, if event for is, is really about studying some, some of these important questions about uh, the way people think about freedom and the relationship between the citizen and the state. So it's got us off to a fantastic start, Stephanie, and thanks for taking time out of your busy beginning of term schedule to come and talk to us. And thanks to all of you who've joined us online uh, and uh, keep your eyes open for future events because there will over the coming weeks and months be be a a range of events that we're organizing uh, around the themes in the program. Uh, But thanks, thanks again, Stephanie, for your willingness to be here today. Thank you so much. And for those who are interested in more measurement on such questions, Uh, You can go on socialeconomicslab.org and there's a range of projects there um, on immigration, on redistribution, on civil liberties like this one that use measurement to shed light on these issues. Thank you so much.